Well, hello, hello, and welcome to Skeptic Week 2. Uh, we are so excited that you've joined us. Thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to make this a priority, to uh, journey with us, to learn with us. And uh, I just wanted to say a big welcome here and introduce myself. Uh, if you missed last week, my name is Simon, and I will be your host for Skeptic. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you with us. If you are uh, journeying in your faith, to Jesus, if you are uh, seeking, or even if you are a skeptic, we just wanted to let you know you are welcome here. I mentioned this last week, but uh, I just wanted to say being a skeptic is okay. It just means that you haven't been presented enough evidence to make a rational uh, decision yet. And so we hope throughout this course to be able to present enough evidence so that you can make a rational decision. And yes, it's true. We believe that rational people can believe in Jesus. And uh, so we just wanted to say welcome and thank you for journeying uh, with us. Uh, the presentation that we're going to hear today is from uh, the lead pastor of Broadway Church. His name is Darren Latham. He was our speaker last week. And so I wanted to welcome Darren again uh, as our speaker again this week. So hello, Darren, and welcome. Hey, Simon. Great to see you again. Looking forward to a great second week of Skeptic. Great topic. Yeah. I love tonight's topic. Yeah, me too. I, I mentioned this last week as well, but this is my favorite of all the skeptic topics. This is this is uh, really good. And um, and then, Darren, I'm excited to maybe throw some hardball questions at you at the end of the presentation today. Absolutely. And uh, these are questions that people can send in. Whoever has a question who's watching us live, realize hundreds of people will watch it afterwards. But anyone who's watching it live can text in their question and we'll do our best to answer them. Yeah, that's right. So uh, you'll see the number pop up on the screen. Uh, don't call me. I'm not answering my phone right now, but you can text me. I'll, I'll get your uh, message right away. And um, uh, if we have time for it, uh, we'll, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can live, your live questions uh, that maybe come up uh, throughout the talk. So even as Darren says something in the talk, something that's, that sparks a question, uh, fire me a text right away and I'll add it to the queue. And um and uh, we'll we'll chat. We'll push back on, on some of the. We, we, sh we should point out that's not your personal text number. This is just a system we use, right? We should make that clear to people. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't GPS locate me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's not. Don't call me in the middle of the week. All right, exactly, that's my point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the text number that we've created for this platform so that we can ask Darren uh, your live questions. That's right. Um, so uh, the presentation you're about to watch, um, it's it's all about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Can a rational person believe that some guy 2,000 years ago was resurrected from the dead? Like, it just seems so crazy. Yeah. So if you're skeptical about this, <laughs> that's okay. That is okay. Um, and what, what we and, want to emphasize tonight, what people see in the teaching is we're talking about historical events. And a lot of people miss that. And a lot of people have a real misunderstanding of what the Bible is and how the Bible came about. And uh, so I hope we can unpack a lot of that stuff tonight. Yeah, great. Um, I also wanted to make note, the presentation that, that uh, you're about to see was filmed in January of 2020. So exactly yeah. one year ago. So when you see people in the video laughing and laughing moistly <laughs> with uncovered faces, don't send us any angry emails or anything like that. Uh, it was, this was all filmed pre COVID. And, right. um, and so uh, we plan to, you know, gather another couple hundred people together uh, at Broadway church in Vancouver uh, to be able to present this course again, but because of the pandemic, we're doing, we're we're pivoting and we're doing it this way. And we should point out that crowd who was with us last week, a few hundred people last last year, I should say. These were uh, individuals who were everything from Christ followers to atheists to agnostics to Muslims to Baha'i, everything you can imagine. We had all sorts of people there asking all sorts of questions. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a, it was good. I I miss everything, but especially the desserts. So I I don't have any desserts tonight, but I saw, I'll still get the great teaching. Okay, Darren, we're ready to go. Anything else you wanted to say before we jump in? No, let's get right to it. 
All right, so here we go. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Let's roll it. Welcome back. Welcome to week two of Skeptic Folks. Now, I'm a little bit concerned of, you know, we've got a gym full of people here, something like 32 tables, and the only table I see that's empty is the one right in front of me. <laughs> now, I warned them last week they might be in the spit zone, and apparently that happened, perhaps. I'm not sure. But uh, so when, if they come in late and you see them, don't boo them, don't hiss them, welcome them, okay? Well, welcome to you as well. Thanks for coming back for week two. I am really looking forward to uh, what we're going to be talking about for the next few moments. Now, parents sat down with their eight-year-old child and they said, son, we need to have a talk. We need to tell you about the birds and the bees. And the little boy stood up. He said, no way, sorry, this is not going to happen. First, you sat me down a while ago, he said, and you said, son, we need to have a talk about Santa Claus. And you told me, there is no Santa Claus. And then, and if you have any children here, that's between you and your children. And then he said, and then you sat down with me and said, we need to have a talk about the tooth fairy. And you told me, son, there is no tooth fairy. And then you sat me down and you said, we need to have a talk about the Easter bunny. And you said, son, there is no Easter bunny. And now you're telling me that you have to talk about the birds and the bees. If you tell me the birds and the bees don't exist, I can't handle that. Well, this course is designed for skeptics and friends of skeptics, and it's de designed to address some nagging questions around the issues of God and faith. So let's quickly remind ourselves of the train that we've traveled so far. Last week, we talked about evidence for the existence of God, and we learned four key things. We learned that God is the best explanation for the existence of the universe, we learn that God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe. We learn that God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties. And we learn that God is the best explanation for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's that last one I promised you that we would elaborate on a bit. So tonight we're going to complete that final point from last week's presentation. That God is the best explanation for the events surrounding the resurrection of Jesus. Now, so far the evidence that we presented argues for the existence of a morally good, incredibly powerful, unfathomably intelligent creator of the universe who exists eternally outside of space and time. Now, this describes the God of all three of the world's monotheistic religions, the God of Christianity, the God of Judaism, and the God of Islam. But tonight's teaching takes an important turning point, because tonight's teaching will eliminate two of those options, leaving us with only one remaining option. So what's the evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ? Can a rational, grounded, facts-based individual be a proponent of what we'll call the resurrection hypothesis. So let's look at the historical facts as modern scholarship knows them. Now, although I fully believe the Bible, which is often referred to as God's word, I, I fully believe the Bible to be God's word to us and, and inspired and inerrant, for the sake of our presentation this evening, I am not I am not treating the New Testament as a set of inspired holy scriptures. I'm not going to do that. What I mean is, I'm not going to give the New Testament any special treatment this evening. Instead, this evening, I am treating the New Testament documents as modern scholars and historians treat them. As simple, ancient documents that have been handed down and need to be tested, verified, and scrutinized. Now, we need to realize something. Maybe for some of you, this may be new. When we talk about the Bible, let's just focus on the New Testament for tonight. When we talk about the New Testament half of the Bible, it's not one book per se. Even the Bible itself is not one book. The Bible is a whole bunch of different books and letters and manuscripts compiled together in one volume. So it's like, you know, it's 66 different books with many different authors, and their works have all been combined into one volume called the Bible, broken up into the Old Testament or the Old Contract and the New Testament or the New Contract, okay? Now, 
Many who are unfamiliar with the state of New Testament scholarship have the mistaken impression that the textual reliability of the New Testament documents is somehow suspect. I've heard it many times over the years. Oh, the Bible, it's a dusty old book that's been translated so many times that we, we've lost the meaning. We don't even know what they originally said it's been translated so many times. In fact, people will often say, you know, Darren, it's like the old game of telephone. You ever played the game of telephone? Where, you know, you, you line people up on the stage and the person at this end, you whisper something into their ear and then they have to immediately whisper it into the next person's ear and the next person, the next person. And as you go down, the line, what ends up at the end of it all is completely different than what they said at the beginning. And they say, that's like the Bible. This thing's been translated so many times over the centuries. Who knows what the original authors said? Well, in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. And let me illustrate that fact with a comparison that I've provided for you on your outlines tonight. Now, on your outlines, we've got uh, essentially these headings, I believe. You've got writings. I think I called it writings. I don't remember. Writings are in the books. And then we've got uh, the original. So when was the original document written? Then we've got the earliest copy. When was the earliest copy? Then we've got the gap. We'll see what that means in a moment. And then we've got number of copies. Those are our headings. And this is a fascinating comparison. Simon said, what a good drawer I am. Look at this. This is without rulers. That's incredible. Well done, Darren. Okay. Now, when history professors quote from the writings of Aristotle, let's say, okay? So that we've got that first one, Aristotle. When history writers quote from the writings of Aristotle, they don't doubt that Aristotle actually wrote the words that they're teaching and reading. And for good reason. Now, do we have the original documents that Aristotle wrote? No, of course not. He wrote, you know, uh, thousands of, of years ago. Um, and so we, we, well, over a thousand years ago, in, in, in fact, uh, a couple thousand years, over a couple thousand years ago, as we'll learn in a moment. So we don't have the original. The, what the historians call, historiographers call the autograph. We don't have the original document that Aristotle wrote. Of course not. It was written hundreds and many, many centuries ago and on papyrus probably. It's decayed. It's decomposed by now. It's gone. Okay? So we don't have the original. So, uh, but when, when did he actually write the original is the question we want to know. And he wrote the original somewhere between 384 and 322 BC. Okay, that's your blank there. He wrote the original somewhere between 384 and 322 BC. Okay? So, of course we don't have the original. We only have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. Okay? But the earliest, uh, the original was written then. The earliest copy we have is dated 1100 AD. Okay, so do we have the original written, you know, uh, between 384 and 322 BC? No, lost. We have a, copies of copies of copies, but the earliest copy we have is 1100 AD, okay, which is a gap of 1400 years. So there's 1,400 years between the original one, which is lost, and the earliest copy that we have, okay? A gap of 1,400 years. However, why, why historians feel pretty secure that when you read Aristotle's writing, you're reading what he wrote, is because we have 49 copies. Now, 49, that's a good number. Because the, and by the way, the bigger this number is, the better. Why? Because the more copies you have, the more you can compare the other copies to see which ones are saying the same thing. For example, let's imagine that everyone left this room and, and you all left your, your skeptic booklets behind, Okay. And uh, next week, some people, different people come in, and they want to know, what did Darren teach last week because the recordings didn't work? So what, what did he teach? Well, we could look at the copies of the manuscripts that you leave behind. Now, some of you aren't paying attention because you're on your phones, and you're not writing down the right words. Some of you are writing the right words, but maybe with the wrong spelling. And some of you are copying exactly what I've written down because you're incredibly intelligent. 
Either way, what they could do is they could gather in, they could look at all of the ear copies, and they could compare, and they could say, you know, of the um, few 200 people, whatever, uh, here, um, you know, 180 of them all had Aristotle and these numbers, and a couple had some different things. So the more copies you have, the better it is because you can compare, okay? So 49 copies, a gap of 1,400 years. Historians look at that and say, you know something? We feel pretty solid that, uh, that when you read Aristotle, you're reading a good representation of his words, even though we don't have the original, of course. Perhaps the most widely attested non-religious ancient document would be the Iliad by Homer. Not Homer Simpson, but Homer, the famous author, okay? When was his, this was written? It was written in 900 B.C., do we have the original? Of course not. We don't have the original. But it was written in 900 BC. Now, the earliest copy we have is from 400 BC, which is a gap of 500 years. Okay? Original, written in 900. Don't have it. Lost. The earliest copy we have is from 400 BC, so that's a gap of 500 years. Okay? which is much better than Aristotle when it comes to Homer. That's why the, the Iliad is just, this is the gold standard here when it comes to ancient non-religious documents. And what's even better, what makes us so certain, is that we have 643 copies. Wow. I mean, that's incredible, to have 643 copies. So we are well certain that the Iliad that we have today is very close, if not identical, to the Iliad written nearly 3,000 years ago. Scholars consider this combination of only 500 years and 643 copies to be historical bedrock. So how do the New Testament documents stand up? How does the New Testament stand up against other accepted ancient documents? Here's the most recent scholarship I could find, and these dates were from March of 2018. This is the most updated information I have here. And this is the most conservative that I could be, so I'm not making this as best as possible. The New Testament documents were written somewhere between 45 and 95 AD. Okay? It's 45, 95 AD. The earliest copies we have were written between 125 and 200 AD. Do we have, by the way, do we have the originals that Paul and the gospel, original gospels? No, we don't. Of course not. They're a couple thousand years old. They're, they're disintegrated. But the earliest copies that we have were written 125 to 200 AD, which is, we'll say, about a 150-year gap. Not 1,400, not 500, 150. Okay? Now, how many copies do we have? Well... When it comes to the New Testament manuscripts, we have, and I'll explain this number in a moment, between 5,000, I'll be estimate, 5,900 and 24,000 copies. You say, how can you have such a huge gap? I'll explain that in a second. Between 5,900 and 24,000 copies. The difference is, it depends on the language you're talking about. If we're talking about ancient Greek manuscripts, which is what the New Testament was written in originally, we have 5,800 and what is it, 56 to be specific, last 5,856 to be specific copies in ancient Greek. And in other languages like Coptic, Syrian, um, Latin, and uh, Aramaic, we have 24,000 of those that have been found over the centuries. Folks, the simple truth is that the New Testament is the best attested document in ancient history, both in terms of the number of manuscripts and the nearness of the copies to the original. In fact, modern reconstructions of the New Testament text have been done, and it has now been firmly established by scholars and historians that, and here's the number, the official number, 99.8% of the New Testament that you have today is what was originally written 2,000 years ago. We have an accuracy today of 99.8% to the original documents. Think in these terms. There are 138,000 words 
138,000 Greek words in the New Testament. When you add up every word in the Greek New Testament, 138,000 words. And of those 138,000 words, scholars are absolutely certain of 136,600 of them. Absolute, no doubt about 136,600 of them. There are only 1,400 words that are uncertain. And those 1,400 words are minor issues such as, did Paul write that your joy may be full or did he write that our joy may be full? We're not sure. But it doesn't matter. It affects no uh, doctrine or no historical importance whatsoever in those 1,400 words. Sir Frederick Kenyon, once the director and principal librarian of the British Museum, wrote this, I quote, Any doubts that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally and firmly established. Dr. Anthony Flew, remember we met him last week. He was a, a one-time atheist who late in his life became a, a theist because of the evidence for fine-tuning. He said this in a debate that I watched and that I have the, the, the book, uh, and I met the gentleman. In fact, the gentleman that Anthony Flew was debating spoke here at Broadway a few years ago, Gary Habermas. And in this debate, Anthony Flew, who was an atheist at the time, stated this. He said, the textual authority, the earliness and number of manuscripts for most of the Christian documents is unusually great. He was an atheist when he said that. So, despite the uninformed ranting of the odd internet infidel blogger, when we deal with the claims around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we're not playing a game of telephone where rumors have grown over the centuries. We are dealing with the claims that can be traced literally to the first century contemporaries and even eyewitnesses. Now, historians reached consensus long ago regarding the existence of Jesus. The 19th and early 20th century proposition that the man named Jesus of Nazareth was simply a legend was long ago put out to pasture by modern scholarship and archaeology. I remember back in the, it was late 1980s, I think, I was living in, I'm from Ontario originally, and... And I was in Toronto where I was living and, and pastoring. And I was at the Royal Ontario Museum because uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were on exhibit, or a portion of them as I remember. And uh, so we were there viewing, you know, these Dead Sea Scrolls at the Royal Ontario Museum. And there was a, a room of, I'll say, three, four hundred of us there and in this theater type room. And there was a archaeologist, a Jewish gentleman, who was speaking. He was traveling with the exhibit. And uh, they, they had other exhibits, the stone that had the Pontius Pilate from the Bible, his name engraved on it that they had found and so on. Fascinating stuff. And uh, I'll never forget, a lady up to my left, she went to a microphone, Q&A time, like we have here, and she said, yes, um, doctor, I'm wondering, why do you keep referring to this Jesus as though he actually existed? There's no evidence that he ever existed. And this Jewish archaeologist from Israel said, oh, ma'am, uh, you're, you're mistaken. We have excellent corroborating historical evidence that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, existed. You cannot deny or doubt the existence of Jesus and be a historian or archaeologist. Dr. Edwin Yamauchi of Miami University, a leading expert in ancient history, stated the following. I quote, we have better historical documentation for Jesus than for the founder of any other ancient religion. So, if someone tells you that we don't even know if Jesus of Nazareth ever existed, they are entirely uninformed and actually ignorant of modern scholarship. Now, I've discovered that while many people understand that the existence of Jesus is a historical fact, they mistakenly think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just have to believe by a leap of faith. That is not true. The resurrection of Jesus is equally a matter of dealing with historical evidence. Now, when it comes to the historical record, there are essentially four established facts recognized by the vast majority of New Testament scholars, critics, and historians today, which I would put to you are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Now remember, as we're about to look at them quickly, these four facts I'm about to present are not in dispute among the vast majority of modern scholars and critics, meaning agnostic, atheist, theistic critics. 
These four facts are not debated. These four facts are agreed upon, even by those who would deny or doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. So tonight, I want us to think of ourselves as a few hundred uh, detectives, and these four facts are four concrete clues that we have to work with, okay? As Simon said earlier, I presented this material in churches and colleges and universities across Canada and various parts of the world. In fact, as I was looking over these notes, I, I, the last time I presented it was at Skeptic a year ago, and before that, the last time I had presented it was actually to a, a group of 70 people in Jerusalem, sitting on benches 20 feet from the garden tomb. Here's historical fact number one on your outline. After his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. This is an undisputed fact of history. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, an ancient Jewish law court. It was the court that sentenced Jesus to death, though they didn't have the authority to kill him, so they then had to convince the Romans to have him crucified. Now, the ancient documents declare that after Jesus' death, his body was wrapped and then buried in the tomb that was donated by this man named Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, historians find this fact to be highly credible due to what they refer to as the embarrassment factor. Now, by that they mean that it is highly unlikely that this is a later legendary embellishment since you have one of the enemies of the early church, a member of the judicial body that had Jesus killed, acting in a heroic manner. Early Christians inventing the story of Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus would be akin to modern Israelites inventing a story that Hitler secretly rescued Jewish children from concentration camps. It wouldn't happen. And for this, among other reasons, historians agree, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Historical fact number two. On the Sunday following his death, the tomb of Jesus was found to be empty by his women followers. On the Sunday following his death, the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, which Christ means Messiah, was found to be empty by his women followers. Get this, folks. The empty tomb is a fact of history. Realize this. Historians will debate how the tomb became empty, but they do not debate whether or not the tomb was empty. The fact that the tomb was found empty by a group of women serves as another powerful sign of authenticity to ancient historians, again, due to the embarrassment factor. Now you say, Darren, what's so embarrassing about a bunch of women finding the tomb empty? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just going to tell you the truth here. As distasteful as it is to our modern sensibilities, the testimony of women was not acceptable in ancient Jewish courts. The only time a woman could testify is if a man was not present as a witness. Women were simply not trusted as reliable witnesses. So an invented account of the circumstances surrounding the empty tomb would certainly not have the first eyewitnesses be women. An invented account that they made up would have Peter or John or some other group of powerfully important men as the first eyewitnesses. The fact that the manuscripts record that it was women who first witnessed the empty tomb is a strong sign of unvarnished, honest testimony. Historical fact number three. On separate, multiple occasions, different individuals and groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, saw what they claimed to be appearances of Jesus alive after his death. On separate, multiple occasions, not just once, not just by one person, separate, multiple occasions, different individuals and groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, saw what they claimed to be appearances of Jesus alive after his death. These appearances were witnessed not just by believers, 
but by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies of Jesus. Now, this is an important fact because any appeal to hallucinations or wish fulfillment, as we'll talk about later, simply does not fit the historical facts. As one example, the undeniable facts behind the story of the man known as as Saul of Tarsus, who we now know as the Apostle Paul, is a crucial piece of history that has to be addressed by every skeptic. Saul was a Jewish religious scholar and by his own account, a zealot who was an enemy of the early Christ followers. In fact, Saul terrorized the early church. He hunted down and he killed the first Christians. That was his job. And while he was on one of his seek and destroy missions, Saul claimed to have had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And this encounter instantly changed the direction of Saul's life. In literally an instant, Saul turned from being a killer of Christians to being a follower of Christ in an instant. This would be akin to Osama bin Laden being the leader of Al-Qaeda at 11 a.m. and being a member of President Bush's cabinet at 11.01 a.m. Historians marvel. What could cause such a radical, powerful, instant turnaround? Saul claimed that he met the resurrected Christ, and he would later die because of his claim. So scholars are in agreement um, that the historical record reports multiple early and independent eyewitness accounts. And these multiple early independent testimonies, even eyewitness testimony from enemies and combatants, must be accounted for. Historical fact number four. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having no expectation of it. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having no expectation of it. As one scholar put it, you need a sufficient launching pad to explain the launch of this missile known as Christianity. And it can't be this gradual ramp of legend being built up over decades or generations. It was an instant liftoff. Men and women who were one day hiding and cowering and denying they even knew Christ were the next day willing to die for the claim that he had risen from the dead. Something happened, literally in an instant, that must be explained. Now, it's important to understand that the original disciples had absolutely no expectation of a dying and rising Messiah. The Messiah dying was like Superman dying. It was unthinkable. A dying Messiah was an oxymoron. Add to that the fact that according to Jewish law, how Jesus died by being hung on a cross, crucified, was evidence that he was under God's curse, not that he was God's Messiah. Plus, add to that the fact that the Jewish beliefs of the afterlife did not anticipate anyone being resurrected until the very end of the world. And you come to the realization that the resurrection of Jesus was a completely unanticipated event. We look back and say, yeah, the Messiah dies and rises again. No, that was not the thinking at all 2,000 years ago. Messiah didn't die. Messiah was a conquering king. He would come and kick out all the Romans and all the enemies, and he would reign forever. He doesn't die. And the resurrection happens at the very end of the world, not before anyone else. As scholar uh, Dr. N.T. Wright put it, in the first century, when your Messiah died, you either went home or you got yourself a new Messiah. Now, if we want to be rational, we need to deal with the facts. When you're rational, facts are your friends. So what are the facts of this case? Here's what we know. Here's what is not disputed. Historical fact one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Historical fact number two, on the Sunday following his death, uh, the tomb of Jesus was found to be empty by his women followers. Historical fact number three, on separate multiple occasions, different individuals and even groups of individuals, including 500 people at one time, claim to see appearances of Jesus alive after his death. And historical fact number four, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having no expectation of it. 
Now, as honest detectives, as men and women who are willing to follow wherever the evidence leads, our explanation needs to account for all four of these historical facts. But here's the thing. Every naturalistic attempt, meaning non-supernatural, every naturalistic attempt over the last 2,000 years to explain these four facts has been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. Understand this. And this is an area I have devoted nearly 40 years of my life to studying. There is not one single naturalistic theory that is able to explain all of the known historical facts of the case. Not one. But don't take my word for it. Let me show you. So, so what are the competing theories uh, to the eyewitness claims of Jesus' first followers? What rational alternatives has 2,000 years worth of skepticism produced? Here's the product of over 2,000 years worth of skepticism. Number one on your outline, the theft theory. The theft theory. And that is the theory that the disciples came and stole the body. This was the original attempt at an explanation from the Jewish authorities at the time. The theft theory. And this is what happened. The guards who were guarding the tomb, uh, they were paid to say this. While we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. So the body was placed in the tomb. And you need to understand how it, uh, back in those days, you weren't buried in the ground. You were buried in caves. So it carved out caves in the wall here of rock. And so they'd carve out a cave, and then they'd have giant stones. They'd have it dig a hole in front of the doorway, and then they'd roll this giant stone, and it would fall in there, it would seal the cave, okay, and they would wait about a year, and then the, that climate, in about a year or so, the body would decompose, then they'd pull that rock back again, they'd go in, gather the bones, put them in an ossuary, and then the cave would be open for someone else to use in the future, that's how it worked, and this one, so they put the body in the cave, that wasn't denied, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, it was a new one, hadn't been used yet, roll the stone, they wrap them up, uh, partially embalm him, put him in the cave, in, in the grave, stone there, and the tomb is guarded. And the first uh, attempt at explaining this was, the guard said, while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. Now, what's the problem with this theory? Well, hold on. Do you mean the same guys who hid when Jesus was arrested, shrank from a woman's accusation around a campfire? Sorry, ladies, but seriously. And we're too afraid to even claim Jesus' body? These guys suddenly conspired to steal the body and to make up a resurrection story? Seriously? I I'm not sure that that, that works. L let's, uh, I need to find someone here that I've, I don't know, so we don't, have we ever talked, Raphael? Have we ever never had conversations, right? Okay, can you, do, would you mind coming up for just a second? I won't embarrass you, I promise. Okay, you stand right. You mind being on camera? You're not in the witness protection program or anything? Okay. So, your English is not good? Not a problem. Um, I will speak slowly. Um, so, you are a Roman guard. You are a Roman guard soldier. Okay? And you were guarding the tomb. Good. Well, man, he's into it. I picked the right guy. There you go. Okay. So, you are a Roman guard. And I am a lawyer, and you are on trial. And your name is Antonio. Antonio, okay. So, Antonio, you were on guard of Jesus' tomb the other night, yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Antonio, um, now, if I understand your story correctly, you said that while your testimony is while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Antonio, um, could you please show the jury the position that your eyes are in while you are sleeping. Are your eyes open or closed, Antonio? When, I sleep. when you sleep, yes. Close. close, okay. So could you close your eyes like you would where you were that evening? C keep yourself in the sleeping position, Antonio. Keep them closed, thank you. Antonio, with your eyes closed in the sleeping position, how many fingers am I holding up right now? You, you don't know, Antonio? You don't, why not, Antonio? Why don't you know? No. You can't tell? No. Okay, try now. No. Okay, open, 
but oh, Antonio, but you said while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. How do you know the disciples came if you were sleeping? You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it, it doesn't take a, a great lawyer to debunk that story, right? How can sleeping guards identify people? And what about the resurrection appearances, including to the enemies of Jesus? Does an outright lie explain the disciples' lie from that, lives from that day forward? Many of them died for what would be a known lie. And what did they gain? They didn't go on Oprah. They didn't get a book tour. They died. And some of their family members died because of, what, because of a lie that they knew was a lie. It, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. And the theft theory has not been proposed as a viable alternative for nearly 2,000 years. So then there's number two. There's the no burial theory. The no burial theory. This was the theory that, that Jesus' body was thrown into a pit, not into the tomb. So the explanation was, back in those days, the Romans crucified a lot of people, and they did. They crucified thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. It was a regular occurrence there. It's how they kept the people scared. And so, and what they would do is they wouldn't bury all the crucifixion uh, people who had died, victims of crucifixion. They would actually have it dig a big pit and they would toss the bodies into a pit. And so this argument goes like this. What happened was, is that they threw Jesus' body into a pit, but the women thought it was in a tomb. They went to a tomb, saw the tomb empty, and they went, woohoo, he's been risen from the dead. Now, what's the problem with this theory? Why wouldn't the Romans simply produce the real body? Oh, hey, stop, stop, time out. You're telling people that Jesus is risen from the dead? No, 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 no. Come with me, Mary, other ladies, come here. You, were at the, you, were, you, you went to a tomb. He wasn't in the tomb. Look, there, there's the body. See right there? And the women go, oh, yeah, sorry. And what about the resurrection appearances? Doesn't explain the resurrection appearances. This theory was never a serious consideration and has absolutely no modern-day support as a viable alternative. Number three, the wrong tomb theory. This is the theory that the women accidentally went to the wrong tomb on Easter morning. You know, women in directions. <laughs> Sorry, but this was the theory. So what happened was, you know, they were originally there when Jesus was buried, and then when they went back Sunday, they went into the cemetery, instead of turning left, instead of turning right, they turned left, they saw a tomb that was empty, woohoo, he's risen from the dead, but they went to the wrong tomb, he was buried in that one. What are the problems with this theory? Well, again, why wouldn't the Romans kindly point them to the correct tomb? Ladies, Mary, come on. Once again, look, roll the stone away. See, there he is. Oh, sorry. And what about the resurrection appearances? This theory never got any traction, has no modern day support as a viable alternative. Number four, the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory. This is the theory that the resurrection appearances were mere hallucinations. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, were so traumatized. They were so grief-stricken. They so wanted Jesus to be the Messiah that they actually hallucinated. They actually so wanted to believe this. It was wish fulfillment that they, they, they thought they saw him, but they didn't actually. What are the problems with this theory? Again, if that was the truth, why wouldn't the Romans produce the body and end all the hallucinating? No, no, he hasn't risen. Roll the stone away, Claudius. There we go. See, he's in the tomb. Oh, sorry. Our mistake, our bad. And this theory does not fit the facts for Jesus' appearances to the disciples as individuals, as a group, or as a crowd of 500 people. Listen, I can have a hallucination. You can have a hallucination. You can have a hallucination. You can have a hallucination. But we can't network our hallucinations. And all the disciples had hallucinations at the same time. They touched him. 500 people at one time. They ate food with him. He served food to them. Plus, preconditioning is a major factor in hallucinations. And this theory doesn't fit the facts regarding the state of mind of the disciples. 
For example, James, Jesus' brother, who was not a follower of Christ when Jesus walked the earth. In fact, James said that his brother, he called Jesus crazy at one point, said he's lost his mind. Until Jesus appeared to him resurrected after Jesus' death. It doesn't explain Saul of Tarsus who became Paul. Saul wasn't wishing Jesus was alive. He was killing Jesus' followers. He was glad Jesus was dead at the time. It doesn't explain. He had no preconditioning, no wish fulfillment whatsoever. And besides, when one has a hallucination involving a deceased person, one doesn't take that hallucination as a sign that the person's alive, but as a confirmation that they're dead. This theory was proposed in the early 20th century. However, I am not aware of any modern uh, evidence among New Testament historians or scholars to support it. In debates and so on, people will allude to the hallucination theory, and then when you say, so are you a proponent of that theory? Oh, no, I'm not, but you know, it has to be considered, but you don't believe it? Oh, no. Because the truth is that this theory has the most problems with it of all the theories. And then there's number five. The swoon theory, the swoon, S-W-O-O-N, not zero, S-W-O-O-N, swoon theory. This is that Jesus only fainted on the cross. He kind of like went into a coma, and he resuscitated in the cool tomb, and he escaped. Some of our Islamic friends have proposed this over the years. So the theory goes like this, is that Jesus is hanging on the cross, and then he slips into a coma, And he looks like he's dead. So what the Roman guards mistakenly do is they take him down. They take the nails out of his wrists and his feet. And they take him down from the tomb. They wrap him up and put spices and so on. Part of the embalming process. Then Joseph of Arimathea has him laid in the tomb. Okay. And by the way, um, Pilate had Jesus' body checked to ensure that he was dead. When Pilate got word that Jesus had died already, he said, are you sure? And the soldiers got back to him, yep, he's dead. But they made a mistake twice. And then they take him, they put him in the tomb, they close, big boulder over the tomb, they guard it. But then, Jesus, in the coolness of the tomb, he somehow unwraps the gauze and all the cloth from around him, like a mummy, like a mummy. He unwraps it, He somehow gets up, and with his beaten back, remember he was whipped 39 times with lashes, with called a cat of nine tails, where it's a leather strap with bits of bone embedded in the end of it, so when the Romans would lash against your body, it would grab hold the bones and tear flesh. Many people didn't even survive that, and it would expose inner organs, historians record. By the way, when you die on the cross, you would die of asphyxiation. You would suffocate. Because they, often it would take many hours, if not days sometimes. You'd be hanging there, and then you'd have to push yourself up on your nail-scarred feet and hands, and you'd push yourself up to breathe. <sighs> and then you'd fall down like this, your weight would hold you down, and your lungs would, would be um, sort of collapsing. So you'd have to push yourself up to get a breath, and then you'd go down like this. It'd be exhausting, and you would die of exhaustion and asphyxiation, which is why when they wanted to speed up the process, they would break the people's legs so they couldn't push up anymore. And when they checked Jesus, they broke the legs of the other two because it was almost Sabbath, and the Jews wanted these bodies down by Sabbath. They checked Jesus. He was already dead. They stuck a spear in his side, and out came blood and water together a sign that that his uh, pericardium and aorta had been pierced. The medical community tells us he was dead. But he's wrapped up, and he actually wasn't dead, apparently, according to this theory. He's wrapped up, and inside that tomb, he unravels the gauze and the the cloth. He gets up on his nail-scarred feet, and with his beaten, whipped back, and he, by himself, from inside the tomb, pushes the stone open, sneaks past the guard, naked. (laughs) He then appears to the disciples in his beaten body, and he says, you too can have a body like this someday. (laughs) And they all celebrated, and he was never to be seen again. Does that make sense to you? I'm not aware of any contemporary historians or New Testament scholars that subscribe to this theory. Folks, that's it. If you're a skeptic or an adherent of another religion, 
You have to choose from one of those theories or propose a different one at a microphone tonight. That's the menu for 2,000 years worth of skepticism. You say, Darren, there's got to be something better. Well, actually, there is one more. What's the state of the art when it comes to the alternative naturalistic theories of the resurrection? Dr. William Lane Craig, a noted Christian apologist and debater, I think the finest in the world, spoke here at Broadway a few years ago. He shared about a recent debate he had on this topic with a professor from the University of California, a professor who did his doctoral thesis on a skeptical response to the resurrection. This skeptic's response to the facts that was Jesus um, must have had a long... Let me put it this way. This is what the, the gentleman proposed. This is the state of the art. Here we go. Jesus must have had a long lost twin brother. I'm serious. He had a long lost twin brother, separated at birth, who just happened to be in the Jerusalem area when Jesus was crucified. And he appeared to people and impersonated Jesus for some reason. Why do you want to impersonate a man who had been hunted down and killed by the Romans? I'm not sure. But that's what he did, and then he disappeared, never to be seen again. I think we've officially scraped the bottom of the barrel now. Let me conclude. Can a rational person accept the resurrection of Jesus? I would respectfully put to you that if by rational you mean dealing with the facts and following where the evidence leads you, the only explanation that factors in all the known historical facts is the resurrection of Jesus. That's why it seems to me, as a follower of Jesus, that a follower of Christ is historically and intellectually justified in both believing and declaring that Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he was who he claimed to be, God come to earth in flesh. Professor Thomas Arnold, scholar, author of the famous three-volume History of Rome, once appointed to the chair of modern history at Oxford University, a man well acquainted with the value of evidence in determining historical facts, wrote this concerning the historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. I quote him. Thousands and thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece, as carefully as every judge summing up on a most important cause. I have myself done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. I've been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and Christ rose again from the dead." What is the most plausible response to the facts you've heard so far these two weeks? For the evidence for the existence of God? What's more plausible? And for the resurrection of Jesus? You don't have to be 100% certain. You only need 51% certainty to say it's more plausible of the resurrection than any of the others. What is most plausible in your mind? Discuss that around the table right now for a few moments. And then we'll open the microphones for questions. All right, all right. Okay, so we're back. Thank you, Darren. Uh, thank you for presenting tonight and um, and for the, this great teaching. We're going to jump right into question and answer time. And so if you haven't had your chance yet to send me a text uh, to get your questions in, you can send a text right now to 604 243 4102. And uh, we'll line them up and we'll start asking some of these questions to Darren. So, Darren, um, let's just, uh, start off by talking about Elvis. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, this is, this is the question. Uh, couldn't, couldn't the appearances of Jesus just be like Elvis sightings nowadays? Yeah, I've heard this before. Actually, I've heard this many times over the years. Uh, I used to hear it more than I do now. Elvis has kind of gone out of fashion, so to speak, but, um, <laughs> Goodness. Yeah. So the question is, just like after Elvis died for years, there were Elvis sightings that people had seen. Couldn't all this resurrection appearances, all these appearances just be Elvis sightings? Well, a couple of problems with that. First of all, Elvis's grave remains undisturbed. And everyone who has ever claimed that his body, uh, that they've seen Elvis, uh, has never claimed that his body isn't still in the casket at Graceland. So that kind of works against this. I'm also unaware of anyone claiming to be convinced, or so convinced that Elvis is raised from the dead that uh, 
they were willing to die for that claim. I've never heard anybody do that. Um, so, I mean, these are this Elvis claim. It's uh, it doesn't really hold water. Okay, uh, I'm 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 only assuming that we're talking about Elvis Stoico, right? That's uh, that's the <laughs> that's well, the. By Elvis the way, I'm also unaware of any. I'm also unaware of any groups of individuals who have claimed to see Elvis uh, all at the same time. So it's just not an apples to apples comparison. And if people were really serious about this, they would uh, go to Graceland and exhume the body and prove that Elvis is still alive. But uh, it's it's not a serious uh, question, or not. Okay. It's a serious question. It's just not a serious challenge. Okay. Uh, okay. Next one. Uh, couldn't the claim of the resurrection be an example of like a legend just built up over time, over the centuries that, uh, you know, one, one little story turns into this, you know, passed on through oral tradition onto the next story, onto the next story. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Jesus resurrected. Right. And again, this goes back to over the years, this whole idea that, um, okay, something happened, Jesus died, and then this legend builds over the decades and then over the centuries until now, here we are 2,000 years later. And sort of like I alluded to in the teaching, the game of telephone, it's a 2,000-year-old game of telephone to a degree. Why this doesn't work is... Uh, Two main reasons. First of all, uh, a gentleman, a famous historian, Dr. Uh, Sherwin White, um, who's a legendary expert on ancient history, he claimed that, uh, that in, in his studies that uh, it took at least two generations for uh, mythological exaggerations to creep into a biography, which would take you into the 200s and the 300s, the second and third century, by the way, which just happens to be the time historically when you have all the Gnostic Gospels that Dan Brown was trying to cite in his whole Da Vinci Code thing. So we're not dealing with biographies that are two or three hundred years old. We're not dealing with second or third century matters. Here's the reality. You have to have an explanation for why the Church of Jesus Christ had an instant liftoff right, off, uh, right away from 30 A.D., Think of it in these terms. Jesus was crucified in 30 AD. The church began immediately. Uh, the apostle Paul, now the, let's understand who Paul was. He was a, a Jewish um, PhD. He was part of the, 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 he was a Pharisee, part of the leading experts who he, his job was to hunt down Christians and kill them. Okay, this was his job. He was not a fan of Jesus. Yet, in the year 32 or 33 AD, so two or three years after Jesus was crucified and his followers claimed he had risen from the dead, Saul was out hunting down Christ followers and he claimed that he met Jesus. He claimed he had a resurrection appearance of Jesus. It so radically changed his life that he stopped being a Pharisee and he immediately became a follower of Jesus and he eventually was killed for that belief, for his claim that he saw Jesus risen from the dead. I say all this because he then two years later was in Jerusalem and he, this is all historical, this is documented and scholars, atheists, theists, scholars all agree on this historicity of what I'm telling you. In the year 35 AD or 36, he was in Jerusalem. He met with James and Peter, James, the former brother, the brother of Jesus, Peter, the chief apostle. He met with them and they passed on to him a famous creed which talked about the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the appearances of Jesus. A creed that was already circulating, uh, circulating in AD 33, which means it was written, a scholars say, between AD 31 and 32. So you have within one year of the event already a creed circulating around the Middle East and then eventually around the world. So we're not talking centuries of, of this legend building up. We're talking an immediate liftoff. That rocket immediately launched off the pad. It didn't take uh, centuries. It didn't take generations. An immediate liftoff. You have to have something significant that happened immediately. And they, immediately they claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. Good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, this next question is uh, a little more technical. We're just trying to get some clarity. Can you uh, cite your sources? 
Remember uh, at the beginning of the presentation where you were going through Aristotle and Homer and the New Testament? Can you just cite some of those sources for us uh, again? So where did where did all that come from? Can you cite the like the the scholars um, that are attesting that like ninety nine point eight percent of the New Testament is accurate? So that's two questions. Uh, the, the first one, when it comes to, you know, the, the writings of Homer, the Iliad and all that kind of stuff, you can find that all over the internet. Um, you just Google uh, reliability or uh, comparing New Testament documents with ancient documents. Google that. Or uh, the easiest source to get it from is uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Dr. Josh McDowell. Well, that's been out for decades and it's continually being upgraded and the sources are being modernized uh, every year. So uh, evidence that demands a verdict, Dr. Josh McDowell, or you can Google it right now. You know, the uh, uh, comparison of New Testament documents with ancient documents, and uh, you'll get those numbers. And uh, and you, there's even more. There's a whole bunch of others. I just, for the sake of brevity, uh, had it just to three, including the New Testament. Uh, regarding the other statistic, uh, you could look to the writings of Dr. Bruce Metzger, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Norman Geisler, Dr. Craig Bloomberg. Any of those gentlemen in their writings uh, cite uh, those statistics. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, and uh, okay, next next question. Um, you, uh, this one just came in. Uh, you repeated a uh, you just uh, said a quote from Thomas Arnold. Is that right? Uh, in, in my presentation uh, at the at the end, yes, yes. It said uh, they said, "Can you repeat that quote again?" They missed it. Do you know? Uh, do you know off the top of your head what that was? I, I didn't Off the top of my head, it was a two-paragraph-long quote. <laughs> so I suggested that the person, uh, uh, when this is finished, this is on YouTube, right? Um, so go back on YouTube, and you can copy it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's easy. It'll it'll yeah it'll be available. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, talk to me here. Here's a question: Are there any references to Jesus outside of the Bible? So what do what we would call like extra, -bibli extra biblical sources say about Jesus or is Jesus involved in yeah. any other writings or only is he only found in the Bible? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. So I happen to have some documentation uh, on that, which I'll get to in a second here. But um, let me say this, first of all, the, the short answer to that question is yes, um, there is evidence of the documentation of Jesus from outside the Bible. Um, but before I get to those, let me say this. Are you the only one who's hearing? Uh, uh, no, I, I do. Uh, it sounds like you're listening to the hockey game in the background or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. So there, I must be getting some other uh, uh, on the microphone or something here. <laughs> so know that, uh, that there's nobody else. I'm not at a party. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I was going to report you. Um, but hey, you know what? When you put your elbows on the table, when you're uh, shaking the table with your hands, your camera's moving up and down a little bit. Oh, yeah, I'm getting into it. Okay. It's a little bit of a party uh, over there. <laughs> there you go. So let, let me say this, that um, going to sources outside of uh, the disciples and so on and the New Testament sources is actually lesser sources, less reliable, because it would be like this. It'd be like... I'm um, saying we have uh, we have people who rode the bus with Hillary Clinton during her campaign in 2016. We have people who rode the bus with her campaign and they documented it all and they've written books about what happened during Hillary's campaign. And we also have writings from people a uh, hundred years later who never met Hillary, but they've compiled other writings. Which would you find to be more reliable? Eyewitness accounts from people who lived with Hillary and were with her for those year or two in that campaign, or people who compiled writings from other people years later who didn't even meet Hillary. So really, if you want the most reliable ones, it's the closest to the source. But having said that, let me give you some examples of references uh, about Jesus from outside um, the New Testament. Um, uh, let me see here. All right. Uh, the fact is within 100 to 150 years after Christ's death, approximately 18 non-Christian secular sources mentioned more than 100 facts about the beliefs and teaching of Jesus 
uh, and early Christendom. This includes miracles, resurrection, claims of his deity. So for example, Josephus, who is a Roman historian, he mentioned Jesus in his book Antiquities, written in 93 AD. And uh, this was once looked upon as something that maybe some Christians had made up, but since then they studied it more uh, and realized that no, um, there were some extrapolations. There were some uh, areas that maybe some uh, later Christians had added, but they peeled those away. And here's the writing that Josephus wrote that even atheist scholars agree this was original from Josephus. Here it is. It says, this is Josephus writing about this man named Jesus. At this time, there appeared Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following among many Jews and among many of Gentile origin. And when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned Jesus to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians who are named after him has not died out. Another gentleman, uh, Pliny the Younger, he wrote between 61 AD and 112 AD. He was a lawyer. He was a famous Christian hater. This man hated Christ followers, and he hunted them down. Uh, he wrote uh, hundreds of letters, and we have many of them. In one of those letters, Pliny the Younger um, wrote this, a direct quote. They were accustomed, speaking of Christians, they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to a God. And they bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny or trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. Again, another gentleman, Tacitus, he wrote this in Annals in AD 116 reporting on Emperor Nero's decision to blame Christians for the fire in Rome. He wrote, writes this, Nero passes the guilt on a class of a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate and a most mischievous superstition. So they're calling the resurrection a mischievous superstition. A mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome. So we have, and these are just some of the many uh, non-biblical writings about Jesus from people who actually hated Christians. So this is wow. the best, some of the greatest, greatest documentation you can have. It's from enemies. But if you think about this, for there to be any mention about Jesus at all in ancient Roman documentation is remarkable. When you consider he was a mere Jewish criminal crucified in the backwater world of ancient Palestine, how he would make it on the radar of a, of a Roman historian is a clear sign that something incredible actually happened in his life. Wow. Good. Thank you. That, that was a rich answer. <laughs> that was good. Thanks for, thanks for doing the deep dive there. Um, hey, uh, talk to me about miracles a little bit. Uh, the whole idea of miracles seems irrational okay like doesn't doesn't just like b believing in a miracle just a lot uh defy all like values of logic and and um kind of how the world is supposed to work uh not logic there's nothing illogical about a miracle they're completely irrational within the, the realms of logic um some people, but the second part of your question is where some people go astray. I've heard people say that, I think it was David Hume uh, who claimed that a miracle is a violation of the law of nature. Um, but that's not true. Uh, that's a, a false definition. You're kind of setting, it's, it's begging the question and maybe that's not the proper term. But a miracle is not a violation of the law of nature. A miracle is a naturally impossible event. So in other words, a, a, a miracle is an event that natural causes would uh, not have the capacity to produce. So think in these terms, a miracle is simply an intervention into the laws uh, of nature. Now, but we have to understand what we mean when we say the laws of nature. The laws of nature are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. 
meaning they're not prescriptive in the sense that gravity must work this way because it's been prescribed by the, the law of nature. No, the law of gravity is something we describe because as far as we can understand, as far as we can see, this is how things work. You know, uh, gravity works in a certain way. Things fall at 10 meters per second per second. And so we, we have these laws of velocity, laws of gravity and laws of physics. They're not prescriptive. In other words, we're not following their orders. They are descriptive. We're describing what we see happen naturally. So a miracle is an intervention into the laws of nature. Just like if an apple is falling from a tree and then I catch it, I stop it from falling, I have actually intervened into the law of gravity. And uh, that is, in a, that is uh, an analogous to a miracle. A miracle is simply an intervention into what would normally happen in the course of nature. And so we need to understand this, though. When we're talking about the resurrection, um, we are not saying the claim of the resurrection or the resurrection hypothesis is not that Jesus naturally rose from the dead. No, the skeptic would be absolutely right. Bodies that are dead do not naturally rise. That, that, that's a fact. That, that's true. The resurrection hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. So all that you need uh, for this to happen is the existence of God and the rest of it's simple. And that's why this is the cumulative case. Last week, we gave evidence for the existence of God. And when you build on that and say, if you acknowledge, yes, I believe God could exist. Well, now you've got to add to that case, the historical facts surrounding the existence of Jesus, the historical facts surrounding the resurrection of Jesus. And if you don't accept um, the a resurrection hypothesis, you've got to choose from one of those other five naturalistic hypotheses, and then you've got the challenge of answering the, the holes in each of those uh, naturalistic hypotheses. But you've got to claim that one of those naturalistic hypotheses are more plausible than the supernatural hypothesis, and you've got to back up your claims by answering the vast problems with each of those naturalistic hypotheses. Uh, so, L listening to the presentation tonight and hearing these answers and and full disclosure i'm a follower of jesus okay yeah. so i'm i'm i might be a little biased in this question but i'm already con i'm convinced but tell me hearing this evidence presented i just feel like it's so strong like if people can't come up with a, a better um defeater of these evidences that you've uh, presented, these these historical facts that agreed upon by historians, Christian and atheist alike, uh, and and like the like the Jesus had a long lost twin theory is the is the current best defeater out there. Yeah. Tell me wh why, in your opinion, why don't people believe? Like why why is there such a stumbling block for people to get on board with this? Well, a, a couple reasons and and. Uh... Uh, you know, w in my discussion with, with atheists over the years and uh, I have friends who, who are atheists, so I had a good friend who he le recently moved away from Vancouver. He had, he was a leading atheist. He had a, uh, his Twitter feed of hundreds of thousands, if not millions. He'd written a book and so on. Him and I would get together. He's been in my home and we would talk and discuss. And the core of his atheism was not historical. It was a philosophical. Um, so essentially, um, it's they have an a priori or a, a, a before the fact uh, belief or asser, assertion that there is no God, that the, that uh, all that is is what you can touch and taste and feel. That uh, there's we live in a completely materialistic world and naturalistic world. That is their assumption and their assertion to begin with, and that's their starting point. And so. Anything that goes against that has to be false. Um, even if they have no facts to, to prove their assertion, again, they a priori, uh, w without any facts, just continue to assert that. So the rejection of the resurrection hypothesis is not based on historical facts. It's based on philosophical position that they hold. And as to why they maintain that, uh, each person is different. Uh, um, 
I, I find it fascinating that the modern definition of of uh, atheism is the, the, the like I'll point out that well you have to prove your atheism you're making a truth claim you're saying there is no God and many atheists now try to wiggle off that by saying well actually no the modern definition of atheism is I have a lack of belief in God and so I'll point out that well that's not a truth claim then you're just telling me your psychological state and I I really don't have a comment about your psychological state. You have a lack of belief in God. That's like saying you have a tummy ache. Um, you're not making a truth claim. You're just making a statement about what you presently believe and feel and think. And you're not making actually any truth claim, and, uh, which is pretty weak if you think about it. Um, former atheists used to at least step out and say, yes, um, there is no God. And here's the evidence is why there is no God. I've heard people say in debates I've had, well, you can't prove a negative. Well, actually, you can. I can prove that there is no there is no person between me and my uh, the, the camera on my screen right now. We can prove that there are no planets between the Earth and the moon. You can prove all sorts of negatives. Um, so, you know, as to why they maintain their atheism in spite of uh, evidence to the contrary, I, I don't know. I can't really answer that. Each person's different. So, uh, Darren, I'll just I'll just finish with this as we wrap up this conversation and these questions. Uh, you know, we got a couple hundred people watching this and uh, people will be interacting from all different backgrounds of religions and and viewpoints and and they all have their own story. Yeah, if you could reach out across the camera and and speak directly to them right now, like what's what's if some the guy that's sitting at home, the girl that's sitting at home right now going, Darren, this is all well and good, but. Who cares? How does this affect my life? Like, what? How does this affect what I do? How I raise my kids? How I love my spouse? Like, what? What is this? How does? What does this matter? Jesus lived two thousand years ago. Dead? Not dead? Who cares? What would you say to them? That's a good question. Listen, everything rises and falls on the resurrection. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we as Christ followers should be laughed at. We should be pitied above all people. I mean, the apostle, the Bible even says that. If he's not raised from the dead, we should be pitied above all people. We're clowns, we're, we're goofballs. Um, and some people are out there saying, yeah, well, that's exactly what I think. But here's the thing. If he did rise from the dead, then everything he claimed is true. And if he did rise from the dead, then he said your eternal destiny is dependent upon your response to his claims, your response to his resurrection. And uh, remember, he, he died in a context, and he was raised in a context. The context was, he said, I came to, to pay your moral debt. I came to forgive you of your sin. I came to restore your relationship with God. And, uh, and my death and, and my resurrection are a gift to you to, to pay the wages of sin. So if there is no God, and if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then listen, your life is, is nothing. Ultimately, it's meaningless, and you can make up your own rules, and you can do what you want, and you have every right uh, to laugh and to spit in our face and my face and, and to haunt and taunt me. Go for it. But if it's true, then uh, you have your whole eternity at stake. So this is no small thing. This is huge. This is your eternity. And I would put to you, if you're sitting and you're watching this and you're saying, okay, so I've looked at the historical facts and, um, and I've got those five options. So I got to pick an option that I'm staking my eternity on. If I were you, I'd want to be really sure about the option you choose and um, because you're staking everything on it. So uh, it's, it's worth seriously thinking about. You can't simply dismiss Jesus as a myth, and you can't simply dismiss the resurrection as a bunch of magical fairy tales. If, if you do that, you're doing that uh, at the expense of present day scholarship. You're ignoring scholarship. You're ignoring the facts of history. Wow, thanks, Darren. That's good. Um, and don't literally spit in my face okay so i so, <laughs> so don't i, I don't know the next week week's topic. The week. pardon me which brings us to next week's topic of why is there suffering and evil yeah exactly is it it's because you're asking for people to spit in our face that okay anyway. that's right so Bring it on. thank you darren for thank you darren for that segue uh yes next week's topic is why is there uh suffering and evil honestly this is like this is 
hard questions that Christians have been dealing with 101, right? Like, why do good things happen uh, to bad people? And why do bad things happen to good people? And so we've been, we've been wrestling with this one for, for hundreds of years. And um, so I, I'm really excited. I know I said that today's topic was my favorite, but next week's really good too. Next it's next week's one of my favorites. How's that? So uh, here we go. We're gonna dive right into the the right into the meat of evil and suffering, and and it's so prevalent in our world. We see it all over. Why does it exist? It, yeah, where, where is God? God, God, God is so powerful. He created the universe, and He can raise people from the dead. Why is He sitting around doing nothing while people are dying and suffering? What's that all about? We're gonna talk about that next week. Yeah, and not only that, but why did He create it in the first place? Right, like. Ah, God must yeah. be crazy, huh? Okay, so uh, I'm excited to dive in that next week. Thank you, everyone, for uh, texting your questions in. Thank you for joining us. Uh, invite a friend next week. Send this link. We'd love to uh, just continue to engage people in the conversation, just uh, reaffirming it's okay to be a skeptic. It's okay to, to rationally think through things. Uh, rational people follow where the evidence leads. And so we... We want to just continue on that and uh, journey journey with you. Uh, if you um, want to continue to journey with us, feel free to download the skeptic booklet um, on uh, bway.ca slash skeptic. Click on download booklet and you can follow along, uh, write down your questions, uh, those kind of things as well. So join us next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, we're excited to have you journey with us. Thank you, Darren, for your time Thank this you. evening. Thank you for your grace and answering these questions. And uh, we'll see you next week. We'll get our static dealt with on my microphone next week. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, we'll see you guys next week.